I may be biased as a volunteer there, but the Talaklin Railway is very special. Rolling through the records, it's the first narrow gauge line that was purposely built for locomotives, and the first railway to ever be preserved. It's now proudly part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site for the Welsh slate mining industry. There's also something very special happening at the Talislin to look forward to this summer. I've covered both of the Audrey Extravaganza weekends to date, and on the 22nd and 23rd of July 2023, it's back to make a trilogy. If you know of this line because of the Railway series or Thomas the Tank Engine, this is the perfect occasion to visit for yourself and support the railway in doing so because we'll be celebrating the works of the Reverend with some of his famous little engines visiting from the Scarlowy Railway. On rare public display will be original paintings and notes from the books, props from the TV series, and Wilbert's own model railway running to his original timetable. There will be new special trains just for the fans and some exciting announcements yet to come. Veronica Audrey will be hosting a lecture of the Thomas the Tank Engine Man. And I'll be around, helping to bring you a live broadcast of the whole event, with plenty of surprises in store. Details will be on the Talislin Railway's website, and tickets go on sale Wednesday the 10th of May. Why not pop by? And now, let's learn about the sister railway of the Scarlowy, the Talislin. The railway was built to take slate from the quarry at Brynig Lewis down to the new Cambrian coastline in Tawin. But horse and carts are slow and boats seem to get stuck very easily. Welsh slate to roof houses was literally becoming a booming trade further north at Penryn and De Norwick. So cotton mill owner William McConnell leased the quarry to form the Aberdovey Slate Company. He hired James Spooner, son of James Spooner, who copied his dad by building the line on a constant gradient. But the Talaklin is not known to have ever used this to run slate trains by gravity, like his Vestinyard Railway. Or did they? The 1920s. In the 1920s, it was possible to hire a slate wagon, which would be left at the top of the line. You and your family could happily take your time eating your picnic and then roll yourself down the hill with nothing but a handbrake. The world's longest roller coaster. There was also one occasion in 1873 where passengers thought the last train had been cancelled, so they had to start walking home. The quarry manager and some plate layers offered them a ride down in some old slate wagons, only to soon find the train coming the other way. It had just been put back on the track after derailing earlier on and was racing to meet them. Everyone screamed and jumped clear, but thankfully both stopped before there was a collision and luckily no one was hurt. Now wait a minute, said McConnell. A steam railway may be the best thing since sliced slate. Oh, that's a tongue twister, sliced slate. But what if we used it to carry people too, in actual coaches? We'll need a nice, catchy name that everyone can easily pronounce, and that states where the railway clearly goes to. And so, the Tally Laddaclin Railway was named after the nearby lake. Does the Tally Line Railway go to Tallislin Lake? No, of course not. It stops about three miles short. And this publicity stunt has been the frustration of people in the booking office ever since. The track is an unusually wide gauge for narrow gauge. It's no coincidence that one of the only other 2 foot 3 inch gauge railways is the Corris, just over the hill. There were considerations for the two to link up, but this would have needed such large viaducts and tunnels to bridge the gap that it never happened. But what a thought. They did run the Grand Tour though, 
which was a circular package route that took passengers up the Corris, by horse to connect with the Talaklin, and then the Cambrian line back to the start. The line was built with a rather tight budget. Bridges were too small, so if the train stopped beneath one you'd be stuck, and the rail ends were held together by sharing a chair and sleeper. When the railway inspector visited, he refused to open the line until significant changes were made. In addition to modifying the two locos, they had to start using fish plates for the rails instead, but never bothered rebuilding the bridges. Instead, because all of the stations were on one side, they moved the track over and just bolted the doors on one side of the coaches shut. Job done! The railway also had no signals, no tokens and very few passing loops, because the rule was that only one of the two locomotives should ever be in steam. By 1910, McConnell moved on and planned to close Brennig Lewis. So, newly appointed MP, Sir Henry Hayden Jones, bought the quarry and railway himself, so that the 300 or so quarrymen wouldn't go unemployed. He didn't have the money to invest in them though, and never made a profit. But the quarry continued taking cost-saving risks until 1946. Boxing Day that year, the weakened supports of the tunnels collapsed, and although, luckily no one was hurt again, the damage was so severe that Brinnick Lewis was forced to close. Sir Hayden Jones had promised that as long as he was alive, he would continue running the railway. So the Talaklin struggled on with just a rundown passenger service. The railway was so overlooked that British Railways forgot it actually existed, so it never got nationalised and continued in its own little way. Author Tom Rolt visited in 1949 and found an empty station with a lonely sign saying, sorry, no trains today. He decided to walk up the track himself, which was almost invisible beneath the overgrown grass, the rails held together by the soil. At the workstation, he found a frustrated crew making patchwork repairs to Dolgok. All in all, a bleak first impression but it just goes to show the fascinating appeal that the Talaklin holds, because he went back to Birmingham and started rallying people together to save it. Over 10 years before the end of steam in Britain, it was an unimaginable concept to want to keep an entire railway just for the sake of it, let alone to do it for free. The timing couldn't have been more critical too, because Sir Hayden Jones passed away in July 1950, and his widow couldn't continue running it alone for the following season. A special train for Tom Rolt and friends was run to see what could be done, but Dolgok derailed just to dampen spirits. Like a rusty old train set they found on eBay, they were graciously given the lot in February 1951, including <gasps> all track and infrastructure, which was so badly worn out that rolling onto one end of rail would make the other end lift up. Four coaches and one brake van, all without heating or lighting, but rare in the fact that the railway still had all of its original rolling stock, plus a bunch of wagons, and two locomotives, one of which was truly unusable, and the other was thought at the time to still be using its original 80-year-old boiler. It's now believed it was on its second, but this was still metaphorically kept together with sticky tape. A bargain, really. But would you have been brave enough to take on the challenge that they did? The group knew that if they were to run the railway as volunteers, they'd need more help. Fortunately, at the recently closed Corris Railway, the McCunsler's station master had sheltered away two engines so that they wouldn't be scrapped. Perfect, they thought and both were sent via BR to Tawin. They fired up number three, only to find it constantly derailed. Derailed. It seemed that permanent way workers had deliberately made the track slightly wider 
to fit number one's long wheelbase. And since then, being the only engine to use it, the track had pretty much grooved over time to only fit Dolgok. And so, the old lady had to soldier on alone. By a strike of luck and good faith, one of the society's new members happened to be the chairman of the Hunslet Engine Company, and he offered to take number four away to be overhauled free of charge. Number three was later given thicker tyres on all its wheels, so it didn't derail so often. And gained the name Sir Hayden after the past owner. Number four was named Edward Thomas after the general manager slash booking clerk slash guard slash assorted other jobs. To everyone's surprise, people travelled far and wide to see the volunteers' railway adventure for themselves. This included American filmmaker Carson Kit Davidson, who captured the unique atmosphere of this pioneering era in the much-loved documentary Railway with a Heart of Gold. British screenwriter T.E.B. Clark of Ealing Studios also paid a trip here which sparked the basis for the Titfield Thunderbolt. They considered filming the comedy at the Talaclin, but the trains were considered too small and it was preferred to take over a disused standard gauge line to have full cinematic control. If you thought the scene where they frantically water the engine with pots and pans using a nearby stream sounded familiar, then you may be thinking of the railway series story Bulldog both take influence from the same real event, as do most of Reverend Audrey's Scarlowy books. Audrey began volunteering as a guard on the Talaclin in its early preservation years, and so it was easy for him to witness the events of his future stories acted out right in front of him, sometimes even because of him. Peter Sam and the refreshment lady tells us how Peter Sam was impatient and set off without an all-important passenger. In truth, Audrey was guarding the train one day and they left without his mother-in-law, until he saw her running up the platform. In a situation like that, it's always easier to blame it on the engine. All such works of fiction helped to put the forgotten Talaclin Railway back on the map. In May 1958, the BBC hosted a live TV special on the railway, and popularity soared. Being a unique gauge, other than the chorus locos, the line can't have many visitors, unless they're put on temporary track at the wharf. Most of the Talaclin fleet have done the same elsewhere. Here's a brief look at each one, but I'll have to make a part two talking about them in more detail, because this video is getting long enough. For now, if you go to the Talaclin's YouTube channel, you can see fact files on each engine there. Number one, Talaclin, one of the two original engines, arrived in September 1864. It's a Fletcher Jennings 040 saddle tank and later an 042, complete with a cab. Number two, Dolgoch, arrived sometime in 1866 with an unusually long wheelbase. Number three, Sir Hayden, mostly built in 1878, was also an 040, now adapted as an 042. Numbers one and two of the Corris Railway were Falcon class engines and were merged together to make number three. Number four, Edward Thomas, is a Kerr Stewart Tattoo class from 1921. In the 1960s, it was trialled with an experimental Giesel ejector, but this didn't prove to make much difference and it now has its regular chimney back. Number five, Midlander, is a Ruston diesel shunter from 1940, which was bought for maintenance trains. Midlander received a beefy makeover in the 1980s, with parts from other Rustons. Number six, Douglas, is an Andrew Barclay E-Class that originally worked at Calshot near Southampton. Built in 1918 to haul trains along the Royal Air Force site. 
Number seven, Tom Rolt, is also an Andrew Barclay, which worked in the peat bogs in Ireland. It was rebuilt as an 042 side tank by the design of John Bate and is now the strongest of the steam engines, being completed in 1991. Number 9 ALF is a 1950 Hunslet shunter, but has been rebuilt with parts from a similar diesel to make it one very strong and very heavy little brick. Number 11 Tracuin and number 12 St Cadfan were built in 1983 by Bagley Jury and were bought in 2008 from RNAD Tracuin, along with a third diesel to use as spares. Oh, and there's also a trolley called Toby, a tamper machine recently named Idris, and as of 2022, a battery electric shunter too. They don't have numbers, but it would be silly to forget them. You'll have noticed that I missed out number 8 and number 10, because these are diesels that were sold on, or the various other contraptions that came before. A video just on the engines is definitely in order, but we need to have a look at where they live first. The line starts in Tawin, at what was known as King's Wharf, originally just made for transferring the slate to the standard gauge wagons. Here you'll find the Narrowgate Railway Museum, with an impressive collection of rolling stock and artefacts itself. As the main station, there's also King's Cafe and a gift shop, as well as a volunteers hostel in a cottage here for members who travel from far away. Under the bridge and a short trip through a cutting takes you to Pendray, the compact epicentre of the railway, as this is where the rolling stock sheds and workshops are. Pendray itself is a request stop and where the passenger railway technically started. Across the only gated crossing and up a steep climb takes you away from the sea and into the Fazi Valley. The farm cottages at Hendy have a dedicated halt, as well as the crossing at Fat Gog. Kunful Halt sits at the top of the next climb and has probably the smallest platform on such a railway. Ridironen is just beyond which is a request stop very popular with photographers and the caravan park here. The track curves and briefly dips down before it weaves past Tinsluin Hen Halt, where Bringlass comes into sight and the station itself sits just over the crossing from the passing loop. The train then steams on through the slippery tadpole cutting and meanders through six bends into the woods. The engine will whistle as you cross the famous Dolgok viaduct and squeeze through the rocks into Dolgok station, the crowning jewel of the Talaklin. A steep slope down into the gorge takes you to the roaring Dolgok Falls. With a walking trail up the hillside to further caves and waterfalls. The engine, meanwhile, is enjoying a well-needed drink from the stream. On vintage trains, they will still use the iconic slate water tower with a basic wooden trough. Onwards back into the sunshine, round the bend the train whistles for the crossing at Quarry Siding. The guest house is located here, named after a long-term volunteer, Phil Guest, who left a legacy to fund a new building to store the railway's rolling stock. 
you'll notice how much you've ascended since leaving nearly at sea level, as you cross into the forest leading into Abergenolwyn Station. This is the longest station as it can hold two trains at once, and has a cafe where the train will stop to allow passengers to have a lunch break. Beyond the platform is the recently reinstated Gate to Adventure. It's difficult not to notice when you're passing Forestry Crossing. And soon after, the waterfall at T Dua. When the line was first built, the locomotive shed was actually here and a series of columns directed the stream across to feed the engine's tanks. It was later decided to move the sheds to the bigger site at Pendre. However, a group has recently rebuilt the slate water tower that once stood here. Down below is Abergenolwyn village, which was developed for the quarrymen and connected to the railway via an incline, which had a series of rails at the bottom for wagons to be unloaded in the different streets. The winding house at the top had to be demolished to allow passenger trains to pass, but the old drum and turntable are still there today. Rounding Big Bend, the last stop is Nat Gwernal, sitting high on the ravine, before the first incline to the quarry. There are three trails starting here that take you along the tramway to the old quarry, but if you're up for a hike, leave yourself more than enough time so you don't miss the last train. That, my friends, is the Talaklin Railway. For any Thomas fan, you don't need me to tell you why this place is so special. There's such a friendly atmosphere here and rich history that it doesn't take a rail enthusiast to be fascinated with the little engines. The route may not be as long as places like the Festinog, but the Talislin earned its title as the railway with a heart of gold for a reason. If you'd like to visit yourself, it's best to start your journey at Tawin, or alternatively at Abergenolwyn. Tawin Wharf is a short walk from the mainline station, and trains run most of the year. Check their website for timetables and for special events. Some highlights include Race Against the Train, where runners try to beat the train up the line. The Anything Goes Gala, where any vehicle that moves will be out and about. There's the Quarryman Victorian train experience. And the all-important Summer Beer Festival. Oh, and of course we can't forget the Audrey Extravaganza weekends celebrating the railway's proud links with the Reverend W. Audrey and the Scarlowy Railway. See the Talislin's website in the description for details and keep your eyes peeled on this channel and the railway's own for more announcements. Tune in next month where we visit somewhere else and subscribe so you don't miss part two where we talk about the famous little engines. If you become a patron of this channel, you can find out when it's happening as well as seeing it early. Please follow the links in the description so you can donate or visit the Talaklin Railway for yourself. Goodbye! Big thank you to all of my brilliant patrons Alex Goodman, GBH Train, D0280 Falcon, Sean Tempest, Nat, 
Random Thomas Fan, Peter Davenport, Ego, Kildane's Coven, Insane Edward, and Dark White 73.